when you get something unexpected that comes your way, <laughs> what kind of fruit is this? Lemon. It's a lemon. It's not a grapefruit. It's a lemon. It's a ponderosa lemon. The purpose of a ponderosa lemon is to create lemonade. And there's a juice of about 10 lemons in a ponderosa lemon. And it is a cross between a citron and a little lemon. That a citron, you can't make juice out of it. That's when they get citronella for a candle. But the citron exists for a different purpose. The lemon exists to be turned into lemonade. Now, each one of us have different things that come up in our lives, dancing lessons from God, things that are, are troubling or difficult or trying in, in life. And when we get those trying situations in life, what are we supposed to do with them? You dance with them. You dance with them, sometimes you dance with them one way, sometimes you dance with them another way. I'm going to pass this around, just pass around that around the room. You know, when the San Francisco 49ers were the poorest team in the NFL about 30 years ago, they had the smallest training facility and they did not have a full football field like any high school would have in order to practice their game. So what did they do? Well, they only had 50 yards. They couldn't pass long passes. They couldn't play and practice like the other teams did. So what did they do? And, and their quarterback at the time was a guy named Joe Montana who was very good at a short game. They just practiced a short game. And they created something called the West Coast Offense. Now, Jim Tressman, the new coach of the Bears, that's what he does. And what we don't realize is that what he does is create a lemon that is turned into lemonade offense. The purpose of the West Coast offense was simply to deal with the fact that they didn't have a full field. And then they found out that they were winning. Sometimes by, by dealing with situations in a creative way, you find out that you're not limited. Sometimes you find that by dancing with God, you're not limited to circumstances being a certain way. That you can be flexible. You know, think about Jesus. We talked about this in our, our prayer uh, seminar on, on Saturday. Think about Jesus' method of healing. Do you remember what Jesus' method of healing was? Of course you don't, because he didn't have a method of healing. He had about 20 different methods of healing, and sometimes there were times that he would uh, just say to somebody, your faith has made you whole. Somebody else would say, stop whining and pick up your bed and walk. <laughs> Another person, he would say, go show yourself to the priest. But the priest didn't even like Jesus. So why did he do that? Perhaps because that person put some stock in the priests and it would mean something to them. To somebody else, he'd say, don't say a word. Don't tell anybody. Why? Because that was a blabbermouth, a person who would, would uh, give off the energy in an unnecessary way. So think in your life where you need to be flexible and meet certain needs. There are other times that it was non-physical healing. He didn't even need to go see the person. Another time, he would make mud pies. The mud pie method of healing. And even, <laughs> he would spit in their eyes. He would actually spit in their eyes, and that would heal them. Sometimes it took more than one pass. He would have to heal them twice, because it wouldn't take the first time. You know, that spit in your eyes. Imagine if the Christian church had gotten a hold of that one as a sacrament. They could have. They could have. What is this all about? It's about dealing with life in a flexible, open-hearted way, not being locked into certain forms. You know, I once did a talk called, What Do You Do When You Reach Your Destination in Life? And the sign says Cleveland. Because <laughs> sometimes you end up in a place you didn't expect, and what are you going to do with that? And, and one time I was thinking about that, and uh, I, found, I, I did a little research, and I found out that the unofficial motto of the Cleveland Chamber of Commerce was, At least we're not Detroit. <laughs> and I was living in Detroit at the time, and I realized it was perfectly fine. Dancing lessons with God. You know, our meditation teacher, Jane Elizabeth Hart, told, Jane, uh, told Lynn and I about 10 years ago that what we needed to do for our next step in spiritual development was take dancing lessons, ballroom dancing lessons. Now, we survived this. <laughs> Rosalie, my daughter, is going to her first dances, and she was joking about learning how to waltz, and I said, I hope that you don't have the grace de gene from my side of the family. <laughs> She's not there. And I remember learning, going T-A-N-G-O, or one, two, three.
three, two. And then I had people come up to me and say, you're not enjoying yourself too much. Are you, are you doing okay? You look like you're in pain. And it was because I was so stuck and rigid and whatever. But you know what? If you put on some Grateful Dead music, I can start dancing, I can have a great time, and I start gigging like this because it's a different order of movement. And sometimes, you know, one way, sometimes another. And I was thinking about this, this, this way of learning how to ballroom dance and how it zigs and it zags, and sometimes that's how prayer is answered. Sometimes it's a successive series of approximations that move us forward. You know, have you ever done um, windsurfing or been in a one-person sailboat and the wind's coming towards you and you tack back and forth into the wind? And you just keep going back and forth and back and forth until finally you get where you need to go. Sometimes it isn't a straight line. Sometimes it's not a, a sprint. The last week I was sharing the 9 o'clock service that the game of life is often more of a pinball machine than it is a gumball machine. It isn't about putting in your quarter and getting what you want, but rather you bounce around from thing to thing and points go off. And the whole idea is to keep the ball in play as long as you can. I remember in, in, in when I was in college, Back in 1972, I'd read my Jack Kerouac and I'd, uh, you know, on the road and all those different things. And I had talked to different people and I said, I'm going to hitchhike around the country. And I, I, I learned something else at that time too. Kurt Vonnegut said, unexpected changes in travel plans are just dancing lessons from God. And I realized that I was going to relinquish control utterly for an entire summer because you go wherever they take you. And you get to experience whatever you get to experience. And I had a lot of very dangerous situations. My parents told me, if you do this, you have to put yourself through college. We're not going to pay for it. And I said, thank you very much. Found a rural college I could afford. Sold brushes door to door. And I went through the experience. And it was one of the most dangerous experiences of my life. My parents were right. But I was protected all the way because I took five minutes a day. My meditation teacher taught me a method putting the good hands in all state hands, imagining a pink cone of light coming down and putting myself there in the middle of it with my thumb out and visualizing and seeing myself in the divine flow of protection. And so even though I had murderers want me to drive to Rio de Janeiro and even though I had somebody threaten to shoot me and I had all kinds of wild stuff happen, everything worked out. I was where I needed to be. Have you ever been in that dance of life where you put out your hand and something is provided where the, where the book falls off the shelf and you, you read it and it's exactly what you need? I remember reading an article by a woman who was an educator. And she had done a study where she was studying how children play on playgrounds and she found out something unexpected that became the whole focus of her life's work from then on for decades. And that's that if you take photography or you take a movie of what's going on uh, on a playground at any given time, you will find that the children are playing in rhythm and even on one end of the playground and the other end of the playground they're playing in a similar kind of rhythm back and forth and back and forth and that she actually could put music to it and all the children were actually dancing to a certain rhythm all over the playground. Even though this sounds totally woo-woo and weird, she went all over the country teaching people the fact that there was an, a greater order of things and the children were picking up on it. This is called by the physicist David Bohm an implicate order. That means that we, they say, are a microcosm of the macrocosm. We're a small version of the greatness of God. That what we're about is dancing with the wholeness of the universe and our job is to be flexible. You say, how can I do that? It's not how my life feels. I don't feel like I'm part of this big thing that is part of my life that moves through everything. I, I feel disconnected. That's why we did the meditation that we did. And with the meditation, what we did was take one person. And in that one person is all of God. In that one person is everything that there is in the universe. In that one person is the whole. And by praying for that one person, you get to experience the love of God. God is not loving, God is love. You were in essence the solder that connected that person's wire with the wire of their universal source. That's why the chaplains become chaplains. 
You know, when you pray for somebody, do you have a problem? Well, every day of your life you seem to have problems, but when you're praying for somebody else, you don't experience those problems. And in being in the flow, allowing the other person to receive that universal love through you, your problems just seem to evaporate. They seem to just become part of the whole. You remember when they first invented um, holograms? Holograms are three-dimensional, you know, figures that, that, that are depictions of three-dimensional reality, done with laser beams. Originally, they did them in glass, and they were great big things. Did you ever see those back many years ago in the, in the museums? And it would be a picture of somebody, and you walk around it, and it would move and all this within the glass. Well, some clumsy so-and-so dropped one, and it shattered all over the floor, and they found that in the hundreds of pieces of glass of that big hologram, there was a little miniature hologram of the image. Every little piece had the hole in it. Every little piece had the hole. And you could move it around and experience it. You are the wholeness of God expressing in miniature. And when you focus on someone else, you get to experience that wholeness of God. So, you say, I don't feel connected. I don't know what to do. Maybe you need to give your love to that from which you want nothing. Maybe you need to express your love to that from which you expect nothing without an agenda. An agenda is down on the level of the ego, but the vision, the vision is of the higher order and you're moving to a different level. You know, I was pondering on this this morning. I was thinking about why we have babies. You know, all the other higher mammals, they are born at a much more developed level. If you take a little chimpanzee or a little ape, and it can peel a banana, it can figure out stuff, even right after birth. But our babies are so helpless. Well, scientists say part of the reason is that our brains are so developed that they have to develop outside of the womb where they never get out. They'd be too big, the head would be too big. That's true, but I think there's an additional reason, and that is the helplessness of the baby develops compassion and the higher order of consciousness in the human being. That baby needs your help. That baby needs you to hold it. That baby needs your compassionate support. And that baby, you can't expect anything from it. It's not going to give you much. The baby says, you say, I, I'm in a bad mood. I'm not in the mood for this. I feel like taking care of whatever. And the baby said, I'm hungry. <laughs> you know, the, the baby chimpanzee will just go and peel the banana and eat, but the baby human, you need to mash up the banana. And then you need to take it on a spoon and go, room, room, and then the baby will go, <laughs> and spit it right back in your face. What is that? That is the development of the caretaking consciousness of compassion. So if you feel disconnected, perhaps what you could do is take one other person, and then connect yourself through that one other person for whom you're praying. You're part of a greater whole. There's a wonderful um, article I was reading this week from a woman who had a near-death experience, and she got to experience the meaning of things and how all of this worked together. She said, when she was having this near-death experience, I mentally turned to look back over my life in a life review. And I had an overarching sense of what my life had been like. And then I mentally started to laugh because I realized that I was not the personality of Pam anymore. In fact, I realized the entirety of my life had just been a game like a Monopoly game. And Pam was the equivalent of one of the game's playing pieces like the shoe or the car or the cat. All of the troubles and joys, the accomplishments or limitations that made up the story of my life were revealed to be mere dust and illusion. I realized that in truth, the I am was who I always was, always had been, and always would be. What exultant bliss. I realized that I had a choice to recognize and rest in this truth of who I really was and stay on the other side of life, or I could continue to reenact the game of being that imaginary personality. And that's what she chose. So if you see yourself as she did from that universal perspective, 
that the Greg of you, that the Liz of you, that the Linda of you, is just a chess piece, it's just a, a monopoly piece, and this game of life is something that there is a player who is the I am of you, the higher self of you. And by visualizing another person, holding them in the light, you can also get in touch with this as well. This means you have to look at life in a very flexible way, a very open way. I was uh, reading, at one point, there was a scribe who was one of the most scholarly religious people in Jesus' day, and he said to Jesus, he fell and fallen in love with Jesus, he said, I'll follow you everywhere that you go, and Jesus shook his head and said, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man doesn't even have a place to lay down and fall asleep. What does that mean? Foxes have holes. They have a place where they can stop and feel secure, a comfort zone. And birds of the air have nests, a place where they can... But the Son of Man, the developing Christ consciousness in every human being, has no place where it can fall asleep. That means that you've got to get out of your comfort zone and embrace what is. I get out of my comfort zone and I embrace what is. Together, I get out of my comfort zone and I embrace what is. Now, right after that, another man came up to him and he said, My father just died. I want to follow you, but my father just died. And Jesus said, You let the dead bury their own dead and follow me. That's not very nice. <laughs> but he was speaking of the issue of taking care of things in the moment, being, se being sensitive to what the needs are. Jesus didn't have one method of healing, didn't have one method of getting points across. He did what was needed in the moment because he was dancing with God. He was part of that implicate order that is part of a greater whole where he could do the dance of life and experience something greater, experiencing something new. Each one of us has a choice every day to decide whether we're going to live our lives from the stuckness of the familiar or the flow of what is possible. You know, Mahatma Gandhi was giving one of the most important speeches of his life. It was in England, and, and a lot was writing on it. And one of his supporters, who was also going to be on the platform, had his notes with him and was ready, and he said to Gandhi, what are you going to talk about? And he said, well, I'm sure that when the time is right, God will let me know. And he said, you have to prepare? And he said, well, I actually, I did prepare. I meditated for two hours this morning. Now, you may not meditate for two hours, but taking the time to set up the energy and the vibration to prepare yourself for the day will put you in that situation where you will receive the guidance that you need, you'll receive what you need when you need it. It's like when Lynn and I, 20 years ago, when I asked her to marry me, and she heard the words, say yes now, think about it later. <laughs> <laughs> there'll, there'll, there'll be, there'll be uh, time in your life, but that's being flexible, being open, not being locked into the familiar, getting out of your comfort zone. And this is true in our spiritual beliefs as well. You know, people don't realize this, but Charles Fillmore, when he founded Unity, he did not intend to found a uh, denomination. He wasn't wanting to start another church. He said, the world has enough religions, thank you very much. He only did so because people started doing it on their own. And he realized in the name of unity he needed to have some say in it. But he did something very interesting. When he filed his Articles of Incorporation, he set it up so that unity would dissolve in 1998. They went back in the 1950s after he died and amended it so it didn't. But he, his attitude was institutions have a shelf life and institutions should serve us and not be served in that way. Certainly there's a purpose to having an institution, but it's only for the purpose of serving the people. If we're trying to do something in some hierarchical way, we're missing the whole point. Another thing he did was he was not about having a theological basis and locking everybody into it. I was sharing in my Joseph Campbell class, and I hope you can come on Tuesday night to the last one of it, where Joseph Campbell, who was a great mythologist, but had very little experience with Shinto, which is the uh, Japanese state religion. And he talked to the head Shinto priest, and he asked him, tell me about your belief system, tell me about what your theology is. And the Shinto priest laughed, and he said, theology? We don't have a theology. 
we just dance. And in Unity, Charles Fillmore was very, very open. And he constantly said things like, I reserve the right to change my mind. One of my ministers as I was growing up used to be in a class with Charles Fillmore, and at one point somebody uh, corrected Fillmore and said, uh, that's not what you wrote in such and such a book. You said this and this and this. And, and, and Fillmore said, well, I don't believe that anymore. <laughs> I reserve the right to change my mind. And being, not being locked down in form. And I remember in my new member classes, I used to frequently talk about how unity doesn't have a doctrine or a dogma or any like structured belief system. And a woman showed up the next week with a pamphlet called Statement of Faith or Statement of Beliefs. And it was written by Charles Fillmore, and I knew nothing about it. I'd never heard of it. It was an old, tattered uh, brochure. So I took it to James Dillett Freeman, who was at that time the head of Silent Unity, and he, he looked at it and he says, oh yeah, this. Fillmore said for the rest of his life that he regretted ever writing that stuff down. <laughs> I read it over, by the way, I agreed with everything in it, but he said, Fillmore said that he, they made him do it because people wanted to have something written down and later he disavowed it. The truth is that there is a living spirit within each one of us. We are a part of that living spirit's expression. And although we may have belief systems, we may have ideas or thoughts about different things, we are not locked down into any particular belief system because, you know, what you need to do on Tuesday and what you need to do on Thursday, what you need to do as a growing soul who perhaps learning assertiveness and perhaps you're learning surrender, we each need to dance with God on a different level in a different way and we've got to be open. We've got to be receptive. How do we do this? We open up to our intuition. How do we do that? By getting into the flow, getting into the connection. And that's why we did the meditation that we did earlier. In the meditation, we took one person. One person from whom we expected nothing. Like holding a baby. You just love it. And what does that do for you? It connects you with something bigger, greater than your personal self. And that's why we're on this journey together. That's why you and I have come together in this room, in this time, in order to grow and to learn and to serve and to expand and to experience something together. You know, God, you, cannot, you can take all your lifetime and you'll never figure God out. But you can know and experience God. You can never figure love out, but you can know and experience love. I think I've shared before, I had a classmate who was thought, I think they were being derogatory, and he said, you know, Greg, you're a real experience. And I said, thank you. <laughs> because life is an experience, and we are all the experience of life expressing itself. And so how do you experience? Maybe by getting out of all the abstract thinking and moving down to one person. One person. Holding them in our hearts. And then experiencing the flow that results when we have a means through which we can pour that energy. So I'm going to invite you to do that with me right now. So take a deep breath and open up into the experience of life itself to know that whenever you're being given something in life, these are dancing lessons from God. Open yourself up. Feel yourself as part of a greater flow. And once again, allow someone to emerge in your mind. Maybe it's someone different this time. And what does this soul need? I may not know how to love this person personally, but you already love this person, God. Open me up to this flow. Give me the ability to express this flow. I build a rainbow bridge from my heart to this person's heart. Let love be transmitted and conveyed through this. Let me remember that this person exists only to remind me of that divine potential and power that dwells within me. As we move into this moment, we let go of all forms and 
can feel the peace and the flow of God. Thank you, God, for all of the experiences of life that teach us something about ourselves, even those things we perhaps didn't want to know. And thank you, God, for this possibility that is opening up for us in this moment. We pray this with gratitude in our hearts. Thank you, God. Amen. Now take a deep breath and let it out. And know that there are many lofty, wonderful thoughts that you have about your spirituality, many abstract concepts that you can stretch and embrace. But right here and right now, let's make the general specific and the abstract real for us by visualizing, allowing to surface in the picture of our mind one person in this congregation. Just one person. And know that by praying for this one person, You are opening up to the whole universe of divine love. Whoever this one is, just say silently, God, I may not know how to love this person personally, but I know that you do. And so love this one through me the way you do. By praying for this one person, I know I am connecting with all love. And so I experience that love in me. By holding this one in my heart, I experience the heart of God. And so, I can know that God, you are not just the love that I can feel, but you are a flowing and dynamic healing force and presence. Because I want nothing from this person, I have no agenda, I have no personal involvement. And so the great flow of God can happen through me more powerfully. I don't have to know personally what is needed here. By holding this one in my heart, I am making myself available to the whole universe of compassion and joy of love and wisdom. Whatever my heart has felt, let my heart be a vessel of love. Placed into loving service on me behalf of this soul. By focusing all of my forces in compassionate love, I get to experience that love.
by allowing for divine healing, I get to experience that healing. And so I take a moment to love and bless this one on the way to birth their personal miracle. family of humanity. I offer myself in divine love to meet the needs of the people in my world, in my life. And finally, lastly, I affirm, believe and know that by offering myself As a vehicle for the current of divine love, I got to experience, I get to experience that love myself, aligned, attuned, and all is well. And so it is. Amen. <coughs> 